story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. Well, now let's look again at what have been wrongly called the pastoral epistles, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, and let's look at them now from just the opposite end. We'll look at them from the address point of view. We'll look at them from the church's point of view, because though these letters were addressed to individuals, they were all about the churches that they were trying to help. And Titus and Timothy had been put there to sort out the churches, but having said that, the differences between their two tasks was quite enormous. Very briefly, let's look at the matter of elders, of leaving behind quality elders so the apostles could go and plant churches elsewhere. In Crete, they had none. There were churches in every city in Crete, but no elders, no local leadership. And so it was urgent that somebody appoint local leaders and leave them with their own eldership and oversight who could help them to grow. So Titus' task was to see that elders were appointed. The problem at Ephesus, which was a much older situation, was that now they had the wrong elders. And Timothy was given the task of going and getting rid of the wrong elders and putting the right ones in. <laughs> Now, why he didn't send Titus to do that <laughs> and Timothy to appoint the elders, I don't know. But maybe Paul knew what he was doing. But that's what he sent Timothy to do, to get rid of the wrong ones and get the right ones in their place. Very different task. As far as the uh, concern about the church goes, in Titus's case in Crete, Paul's concern was about the quality of membership. It was not good. The members were a mixture. There was too much of their background in their character, and the Cretans were notorious people. They really were a wicked lot. And uh, that had come in to the membership, whereas the concern for Ephesus was that the leadership was all wrong. The members were okay, but the leaders were wrong. So we get a different emphasis. In the letter to Titus, the emphasis is on what members ought to be, but in 1 and 2 Timothy, the emphasis is on, on what leaders ought to be, which makes the total picture really. In both cases, there was error. In both cases, there was false teaching coming in bad teaching. But in Crete, the problem was peripheral. It wasn't central. In Crete, the problem was on the edge of the church. There were some funny ideas floating around the fringe of the members. But in Ephesus, the bad teaching was in these wrong leaders. And so it was absolutely central to the health of the church to do something about that. Do you follow me? so that the false teaching is there in the letter to Titus, but it's, it's almost an afterthought, you know, it's secondary to the main thrust, whereas in 1 and 2 Timothy, these bad teachers are right in the forefront and really have to be dealt with. There were three tasks that Paul gives to both Timothy and Titus, but in varying emphasis because of the different situation. They are to do three things. First, they are to complete the transition from a church that is dependent on apostles to a church that is led by local leaders. That's a very important transition, so that they become independent in the right sense and no longer dependent on those who started them. And of course, good leadership makes people less and less dependent on you. Bad leadership makes people more and more dependent on you, but good leadership, good parenting will make your children more and more able to do without you. Bad parenting keeps children on the apron strings, you know? So good teaching 
makes a pupil more and more independent of the teacher and able to find things for themselves. Bad teaching means they keep coming. Do you see what I'm getting at? So that to complete the transition, it was essential to leave behind, in every case, quality leadership and quality membership. And then the quantity could follow. But the important thing at the beginning of a fellowship, some of you are in new fellowships, and you've learned the hard way probably. You've got to have quality leadership and quality membership before you grow. You've got to get the good foundation in. Then you can bring in many, many people and get them converted. But if you've got poor leadership and poor quality membership and you try to grow, you're in trouble. The second thing, to confront the troublers, the people who were troubling the situation, and confrontation is an important part of church leadership. If you neglect a problem, it just gets worse. If you're not willing to go and face up to it as soon as it appears and deal with it, you can push it under the carpet for so long, but it has a way of getting worse and worse, and then it blows up in your face. How many of you have been in churches where something's been going on, you know, and it's not been dealt with by the leaders, it's not been confronted, and they've tried to ignore it and pretend it's not happening. And then the whole thing blows up and the church is split. You, you've seen that, haven't you? It's important to confront those who trouble a church. Whether they're in the membership or the leadership, they need to be confronted and faced with what they're doing. And there are three things that need to be dealt with. I'm going to deal with this all in detail in a moment, so I'll come back to the detail. And the third most important thing when you're laying the foundation in the church, is to communicate the truth. Ultimately, the best safeguard of a church is constant good teaching. And I can't overemphasize that. The churches that are not getting constant systematic teaching of God's Word become very vulnerable to all kinds of mischief. But the constant confrontation with the Word of God the communication of the truth of the gospel is going to save many churches. That's why I long to see the Word and the Spirit brought together in fellowship. Both are needed. The Word without the Spirit you dry up, the Spirit without the Word you blow up, but the Spirit with the Word you grow up. That's not my own, but I pass it on. It's a good faithful saying, it's a trustworthy saying. Well, let's just go through these three things in some detail. Both Timothy and Titus were to leave just as soon as possible, but they were not to leave before these two things were in place. And Paul said, do these as quickly as you can, and then come to me. Quality leaders. This is absolutely vital. I spend a lot of my days uh, having seminars for pastors and church leaders. And I always tell them this, the biggest problem with your members is that they follow their leaders. Because they usually grumble to me and say, the members don't follow us. I say, they don't follow what you say, but they do follow what you do. Inevitably, people unconsciously follow their leaders. They don't follow what the leaders say, they follow what the leaders do. And one of the awesome, frightening responsibilities of being a church leader is that you see your own strengths and weaknesses appearing in the church. That is the danger of a one-man ministry because his character will become the character of the fellowship, where you've got a multiplicity of leaders, a plurality of elders, then they will contribute more strengths and balance each other out much better. But one man will communicate his own strengths and weaknesses to the church he leads, because people do follow. Unconsciously, they become like their leaders, but they do not become like what the leaders say. They become like what the leaders are and do. And so here we have in these letters uh, the quali qualifications of church leaders, of elders, and of deacons. And the qualifications, you notice, are not gifting or ability, but character. It's not so much what the leaders can do that makes them a leader, but what the leaders are, and what they are at home and what they are in public, 
and what the world thinks about them. Now, when your fellowship was choosing an elder, did you ask unbelievers outside the church for a recommendation? Did you? We once did that in our church. I confess we only did it the once. But we got a report of a man we were considering as an elder from his workmates. And you know what they said? They said, you'll be lucky to have this man. Now, lucky is not a word Christians <laughs> normally use, but it was their word for saying he's a good man. You have Do you know that gave us confidence in that man? A good report from outsiders, not just a good opinion from insiders, but a good report from outsiders. And the qualities of character that the man is not given to temper, that he's not uh, given to money, that he can manage his own household, that he's married to one wife. When somebody asked me, can a woman be an elder? I said, yes, as long as she's married to one wife. Because <laughs> that's, that's one of the qualifications, but there we are. I'm afraid I am quite convinced from Scripture that eldership is a male responsibility. As discipline in the home is the father's responsibility ultimately, discipline in the church is also the responsibility that God has laid on the men. Uh, but that's another story. You must read my little book, Leadership is Male, for that. Uh, deacons and deaconesses are mentioned, those who serve the church in a practical capacity. But it's just as important that their character is looked at, and not just their ability. You should choose a treasurer or a property deacon as someone who has character. The catering deacon, someone who has character. That is because the important thing in working for the Lord in the church is relationships. Not ability, but relationships. Ability helps, of course. But it is interesting that the quality of the leadership is not their ability. The only ability mentioned of elders that is the apt to teach, because the elders will be teaching, but that doesn't mean the ability to get up and speak. It means the ability to communicate. And that can be done on a one-to-one. -one as well as on a one to a thousand basis. So these are the qualities of leadership. And these two letters, or these three letters, give us more about the qualities of leadership than any other letters Paul wrote. And they're jolly good. I remember when we were choosing elders at both the churches uh, we worked for, uh, I simply preached my way through Titus and Timothy before they were chosen. And I remember in both cases, the church asked me to choose the initial elders, and I said, no, I will tell you what to look for, and you must find them. And they, in both cases, found just the ones I would have chosen. But you see, it's important to educate the people to know what to look for, and that the church recognizes its leaders, because sheep will only follow a shepherd whose voice they know. I think it's very important to let the church take responsibility for recognizing those whom God has given to them as leaders, and having recognized them will cooperate with them. It doesn't ever say that we have to blindly submit to church leaders, but it does say, be persuaded by them and give way to them, give them a chance to lead. But what about quality members? We have to read Titus for this. And the quality of membership is seen in their church, in their home, in their work, and in their society. And it's a very interesting program if you look through it. The letter to Titus is a wonderful church membership training class curriculum as to how a member adorns the gospel. Isn't that a lovely word? That we are to adorn the gospel, make it look attractive. And Paul's constant concern in these letters is that the church looks right to the world. That even the church elders have a good reputation outside the church. That the church itself adorns the doctrine. And to adorn is to make it look nice and attractive to people. We are to make the gospel look attractive to people. And the interesting thing is here that the list of virtues that Paul uses in this letter are not a Christian list of virtues, but the Greek list of virtues. 
So the Greeks did have a list of what they considered was good in people. The unbelievers know what's good. And Paul actually uses the pagan list of what is good and says, now you Christians, you've got to live up to what pagans count good. Now, isn't that interesting? That quality membership is not what the church considers quality membership, but what the world will consider quality membership. And we should be at least what the world calls good and more. That's what he's saying. So what the world considers good, you know, the world are not fools. They have discernment. The common people heard Jesus gladly. And the common people can see through church people like that, believe me. They know when the emperor has no clothes. And they see through us, they do. Always credit unbelievers with being able to see the difference between a good life and a bad life. And someone who's living right and someone who's living wrong. Okay, they may not come up to Christian standards, but they've got their idea of what a good person is. And Paul says to Titus, uh, Titus, make sure your members are good in the eyes of the world and live up to at least pagan standards. Do you remember when Paul criticized Corinth for that man living in incest? He says, even pagans would say that was wrong and you're allowing it in the church. You see, it's not just living up to Christian standards. We ought to be living above the world's standards. They should be able to say, looking at people in the church, now they're good people. They're good. Quality leaders, quality members. And the quality of the membership will also be in their relationships with each other. In particular, the relationships between men and women. Gender still applies in the church. We are not neutered in Christ. We are to be manly men and womanly women. And they, the world should be able to see what manhood is and what womanhood is, as God meant it to be. The trouble is, everybody wants us to be personhood. <coughs> and the church should stand out against that and show what God meant a man to be and what God meant a woman to be. That's all part of being a demonstration, of adorning the gospel, of making it attractive. And you know, when, when men out there see Christians as real men, they, they, they come. I've been working among men only for the last, what, five years, darling? Four to five years. Two weeks ago, we had 230 men in this very room. And when men see men who are real men for God, it touches men, you know. I tell you, the last two parish churches I've spoken in, there were five women to one man in the church. That's not adorning the gospel. The gospel is for men and women. And so I've done what I can to strengthen the men of the church. It's adorning the gospel. It really is. But women can adorn the gospel as well and show what a good woman can be. Well, that brings me probably to the most controversial teaching in these epistles. And you know, the feminists hate these epistles. They hate them. And they attack them any way they can. Feminist theologians, I've got a lot of their books on my shelf. I want to hear what they're saying so I can understand. But they say five things about these letters where they touch on men and women. First, they say they're not Pauline. They're a second century forgery in his name. Second, they say if it is from Paul, then this is a throwback to his rabbinical days before his conversion. And as an old man, he went back into his Jewish childhood when he was speaking. They say, thirdly, this was purely cultural and that if Jesus were alive today, he would have chosen six men and six women as apostles. That's being said widely. And the favorite phrase is that Paul was culturally conditioned. Now that phrase is being used everywhere today inside the church. Watch that phrase, saying that Jesus' choice of 12 men to be his apostles was culturally conditioned, that it was tactful because in his day it would have been offensive to have women apostles. Listen, since when was Jesus tactful? <laughs> since when did he go along with the culture of his day? That's a libel on my Jesus. One of the compliments that the Pharisees paid him was, you pay no attention to any man. 
And if it had been right for him to do it, then he'd have done it. Don't tell me that Jesus was culturally conditioned. But that's what we're up against. Fourthly, they say, well, even if Paul did write it, it was heretical. And fifthly, they say, it was due to the lack of education in women in those days. And now that women are educated, we can change the whole teaching. Well, on that score, Paul shouldn't have let uneducated men lead the church either. But many of them were uneducated. The twelve apostles were. They took knowledge of them that they were uneducated men. It's not a matter of education at all. It's a matter of God made us men and women, and we need each other. And he made us for different roles and responsibilities. And when men behave like women and women behave like men, we are distorting God's creative beauty. And in this way we adorn the doctrine. Well, this is not popular teaching today, but it's there in the Scripture. I can't get around that. The second great task was to confront the troublemakers. Paul, when he left the Ephesian elders for the last time, they went down to the seashore and he said, he wept over them. He said, I know that after my departure, wolves will come in, in sheep's clothing, into the very flock. And he says, they'll destroy you from the inside. And that prophecy was now coming true. And that's why he sent Timothy to get rid of the wolves who were right in among the flock now. Jesus had said the same thing. This was his basic reason for writing 1 Timothy, which was not his last letter. Uh, let's see now the three ways in which those wolves had to be tackled. First of all, the errors they propagated. They had all sorts of weird teaching. They had a teaching that the resurrection was past that the only resurrection Christians would have is the spiritual resurrection when they're born again. See, that's being said today, I've heard it. But there's a future resurrection for us. And Paul wanted Timothy to correct that. There was the same Greek attitude to the body, the same asceticism of trying to deny the body food and sex in order to be more holy. Paul told Timothy, you correct that as well. There were certain Jewish elements, an emphasis on genealogies, an emphasis on the kosher food laws. All sorts of things have been coming in, false teaching, assimilating to culture. And above all, they'd got into a lot of foolish controversies and academic discussions which were of no value whatsoever. And you know, there are all sorts of questions we get asked as teachers, and some of them are very sincere and some of them are very important, and some of them are silly. And we've got to tell people when a question is silly, and that it's not going to help them at all. For example, someone came up to me in the last ten days, looking very earnest, please could I ask you a question? I've been very troubled. And I said, what is it? And he said, I've been reading the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and it struck me that there's a profound theological principle involved in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And I looked at this man, I'm sorry, but I could give you dozens of illustrations like this. And he saw my face, he said, you think I'm crazy, don't you? I said, yes. <laughs> and the conversation finished then. See, we mustn't get involved in useless discussions. There are important things to discuss and important questions to ask. But you can get in, involved in all kinds of... Do you know one of the biggest discussions on, in the Middle Ages among theologians? How many angels could stand on the point of a pin? And it occupied theologians for some considerable time. It's the classic case of getting involved in silly discussions. And you know, when you get bad teaching, that's what it leads to. It leads to silly questions that you go on chewing around, and it does no good to your daily life. There are questions about heaven and hell that I can't answer, that God hasn't answered, and I don't answer them, because there's no point in getting involved in questions that God hasn't bothered to give us the answer. Let me give you a, an important example. I get asked by parents who've lost a baby, will my baby be in heaven or not? And I say, I do not know. God hasn't told us. I said, the one thing I am sure of is this, that whatever God does 
with your baby will be the right thing. I said, if you know him as I do, you'll trust him to do the right thing with your baby and you won't want the answer. You see? We mustn't get involved in speculation. And that is what was happening. And time and again, Paul has to say to Timothy, Timothy, stop these speculations about things that we don't know. Stop this useless discussion because it's not helping the church to get involved in questions for which there is no clear answer in the Word of God. It's amazing how you can get involved in that. So they were propagating errors. But worse than that, they were giving a bad example. It wasn't just what they were teaching, it was how they were living. This is why he puts an emphasis on the good character that elders need. And if you read that carefully between the lines, you can read off what the bad elders were like. There were people who couldn't manage their home. There were people who were greedy for money. There were people who couldn't keep their temper. And so when you read the list of what an elder should be, you're reading also the list of what the elders at the Ephesus church were not. Do you follow me? That's how you read between the lines of a letter. And so we know that they were characters of pride and characters of greed. Now Paul says a good elder is worthy of a double honorarium. I like that text. <laughs> it has been badly translated in most English versions. An elder who labors in preaching and teaching is worthy of double honor. And I know many churches would rather give their elders honor than honorarium. <laughs> but in fact, the word is honorarium because the next sentence says, a laborer is worthy of his hire. There is a paid ministry here. And an elder who labors in preaching and teaching, well, what's the difference? Preaching the gospel is to unbelievers, teaching is to believers. And here's an elder who's preaching outside the church and teaching inside. And that man is worthy of double salary, says Paul. There's a very important little text which I throw out to you. There are not too many elders who do both, but it says if they do both and labor well in both, you should give them double honorarium. But he's saying you should not be paying these bad elders anything. And that would soon cure it, wouldn't it? Especially if they were lovers of money. What he's saying is that the leadership must spring from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith which means these bad elders didn't have any of those three things. They were not only propagating errors, they were presenting a bad example. And the third thing, the effect they produced was catastrophic, was devastating. They were a sickness, they were like gangrene in the body because they were a strange mixture of license and legalism. And the amazing thing is those two things go together. And very often, people with a legalistic outside have a licentious inside because both are of the flesh. And there's a strange mixture of legalism that's setting rules for others and yet an indulgence of themselves. It's embarrassing to say this, but it says that these were going after weak-willed women. And there's always a danger in men counseling women and women counseling men. And these men were spending their time in the houses of widows, widows and weak-willed women. You get the picture? You watch leaders who spend all their time with the women in the church and are getting around weak-willed women. That's a sure sign they're not right. It was sickness in the body, it was a disease, it was a demonic thing. Paul said it's demonic. Now. Timothy particularly had to confront the troublemakers, face them with what they're doing, deal with it quickly, get them out of the way and get good elders in there quickly because he said that church is going to be destroyed from the inside. The, she the sheep are going to be destroyed by wolves within the flock. A church can stand anything from outside, but from the inside that's dangerous. And the final thing, they are to communicate the truth because ultimately that is what keeps the church from this. 
sooner or later, that's what's uh, got to be done to counteract this. Again, I've said it, but let me emphasize it. The best antidote to the false is the true. The best antidote to bad teaching is good teaching. The best antidote to bad behavior is good behavior. The best antidote to bad belief is good belief. And those of you who know my ministry know that I've made top priority the time that is needed to prepare teaching for people. It takes about a year to prepare the series we've just made on video. And I reckon, it, well, I can't speak for others, but it takes about an hour in the study for five minutes teaching in the pulpit. And I believe that the most urgent need is the systematic teaching of the whole of God's Word. That's what gives people ballast in the boat. That's what really enables them to be proof against. Do you know why the cults who call at our doors, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, do you know? They make most of their converts from church members who are not properly taught. See? And they come and they say, we will teach you the book of Revelation. And those church members who've never been taught the book of Revelation fall for it because they haven't got a sound understanding of it. You follow me? Teaching the Word of God gives people that proof against the misinterpretation that they encounter from all sorts of places. So, this aspect is the most useful thing to do, but teaching has to be verbal and visual. People have to hear and see the truth. And therefore the truth is communicated in two ways. Timothy, you have a message that you must declare, but you must be a model to be demonstrated. That's the challenge to every teacher. Well, a lovely compliment was paid to my wife in Germany. Uh, we went to the Women's at Low European Conference to speak. That's not my scene. Uh, I, f I feel like a lion in a den of Daniels. But afterwards somebody came up to me and they said, Well, Mr. Pawson, we heard the truth from you, but we saw it in your wife. Really, they should have seen it in me too, <laughs> but that's what they said. We have to be a message and a model at the same time. A man who doesn't model his message will not communicate. They need to hear and see the truth, and then that will protect the flock against all these perversions that can come in. Well, how do we apply these letters today? Let me just give you one or two simple ways to apply them. We find the principles, then we apply them. And these letters are full of pastoral hints. First of all, the distinctions of age and sex still apply in Christian fellowship. And younger Christians should respect older Christians. And men should respect women, and women respect men there are still the differences of age and sex in the church, and these differences need to be respected. Secondly, a church's goodness must equal and exceed the world's idea of what is good. That's a very important principle, because the world is not fooled, and the world knows what a good person is and they expect to see good people in church. The one thing that puts people outside the church off is to say, well, look at so-and-so in the church. If that's what being a Christian is, I don't want to know. A third principle is that character is more important than ability in church leadership. Another principle is that shepherds are responsible for the state of the flock, not the sheep. The Bible never blames the sheep for the state of the flock, only the shepherd. And speaking as I do to a lot of pastors, pastors are only too ready to blame their people for the state of the church, but God always holds the shepherds responsible for the state of the flock. 
Another principle is that sound, healthy doctrine covers how we behave as well as what we believe. The word doctrine has come, become limited and is only limited to the right kind of belief. In Scripture, sound doctrine is the right kind of behaviour as well. Belief translated into behaviour. Another principle is that the church is a family, but it has no father on earth. No human father. It has a divine father, but everybody on church, leader and member alike, are brothers. That's very important. We are not to call anyone father. Next, they tell us that welfare within the church must be discriminating. We must not take on the responsibility of others. For example, it says that if a family of a widow is capable of looking after that widow, the church should not undertake that. There's a misguided philanthropy that takes on too much welfare, and we should not take away the responsibility for orphans or widows or whoever from those who have that responsibility. You with me? The church was told to take on the care of those widows who had no one to care for them, but not of those who had a family. The church has got to be sensible in its looking after the needy. Profound principle in here. The final principle, I would say, which is the most serious, is this. And it's with a heavy heart that I finish here. But if the letters to Timothy and Titus teach us anything, it is that the biggest battles we are going to face are inside the church. I wish I hadn't to say that. But the biggest battles are inside the church. Compared with those battles, the battles with the world outside are not insignificant, but they're not primary. The biggest battles we have in our day is to protect the true gospel, the truth of the gospel, from being politicized, feminized, relativized, and syncretized. All these things are church in our country. And like Timothy, we must not be timid. We must deal with these attacks on the truth of the gospel and contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. It is a sad and sorry battle. My wife would bear me out. Our biggest battles have been inside the church, fighting for the truth of the gospel, when we need all our energies to be fighting for a salvation of a lost world. Nevertheless, we've got to fight within the church for the truth of the gospel, because otherwise the church will not be able to save the world if we lose that truth that sets men free. That's my final conclusion from these letters. If you're a Timothy or a Titus, then fight for the truth of the gospel and for a church which adorns the gospel and makes it attractive to the world outside, demonstrating as well as declaring the kingdom of God.